Uh, it's a pleasure and an uh, honor too to be there in front of such an impressive uh, audience for this uh, inaugural lecture, as you mentioned. By the way, I don't like too much the word lecture, and still less the French uh, way of saying it, uh, leçon inaugurale, uh, or inaugural lesson. Uh, it's not my intent to be any kind of a professor. I just uh, would like uh, very simply to share some <coughs> visions and thoughts that we may have, or, or that I personally have, uh, on those issues of energy and uh, nuclear energy in, in particular. If I find how it works. So, uh, sharing those thoughts, I will try to go through a few, uh, few items. Uh, global perspective, global context, where we are. Uh, of course, somewhere there, a few words about EDF, what we are, what we do. <clears throat> and then uh, a focus on nuclear energy uh, within EDF and within uh, our visions and, uh, and strategy. <clears throat> and to finish, some words about uh, people. <clears throat> so, let's start. In our world, uh, there are a few very important uh, issues or challenges, some of them like uh, water, food, um, demography uh, in general, uh, conflicts, and so on. So those are very important uh, issues that we have to face. But among all those, energy is very certainly one of those very important uh, issues with very different aspects into it. Uh, it's a social challenge in some way. Uh, about 9 billion people are anticipated to be there on the Earth by 2050 or so. And uh, to supply all those people, uh, there's a big need for energy growth in the world. And you will see figures like 40% increase uh, in the next 20 years, which is tomorrow, in fact. <coughs> Presently, uh, more than one 1.5 billion of people do not have access to electricity. Providing electricity to them is uh, a big challenge, and they need it. <clears throat> and of course, all this uh, supply to all those people have to be secured in some way or other. Maybe for the same kind of reason, it's uh, an economic, a huge economic challenge that will require very massive investments uh, to be built to keep up with the demand. I just put there some figures. Uh, in Europe, uh, twice as much in, in China. And just to illustrate that, 1,300 gigawatt uh, would represent about 1,300 uh, <coughs> big units of 1,000 megawatt each, uh, only in, in China. And uh, in the area of economy, uh, those investments have to be profitable, the prices have to be affordable in order to, to allow real implementation of that. It's also an environmental challenge uh, because of the uh, resource scarcity, the resources are limited in a number of areas, and also because uh, energy is one of the leading sources uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, all those challenges are all the more pressing uh, with the demand growing very fast in uh, so-called emerging uh, countries. Uh, and some of those countries are the biggest uh, in the world. Looking at, at electricity, uh, about one third of those global energy needs are met by electricity today. <coughs> And this share of electricity is more likely, uh, very likely, going to increase for a number of reasons. There are usage which are very specific of electricity, uh, all the phones, uh, electronics, and so on, of course. <coughs> but with the demography, there is a heavy trend to urbanization, to large urbanization, and uh, big cities is certainly an area where electricity is more convenient than any other, other uh, type of energy uh, supply. <coughs> it's also an opportunity to 
for substitution to shift from uh, fossil uh, energies to low carbon energy mix. And so, given those reasons, uh, you can imagine growth rates around 2 to 3 percent uh, each year, which means it's another way to put the figures uh, on the previous slides, uh, a little less or about 5,000 gigawatts of electrical plants to be built in the coming 20 years. And 20 years is very short uh, compared to the uh, length of time of those uh, type of plants. <clears throat> in the world, about one third of the electricity is produced without emissions of greenhouse gases. I should say only one third. <clears throat> Uh, you have here some figures about the respective shares of uh, the different uh, sources and clearly uh, this share has to be increased to reduce the impact of greenhouse gases. <clears throat> there are different means to produce uh, electricity. I guess I put there the, the main ones and each of them has very specific uh, characteristics I just cite there a few of them which uh, lead, I would say, or drive the industrial choices uh, and the energy policy choices which can be made. The, the main drivers are, of course, the amount uh, of, of resource which uh, is there, uh, its nature, whether it's uh, intermittent or uh, you can uh, have it uh, all the time when you need it. Uh, of course, the environmental impact, and I have put there some figures uh, related to the emissions of CO2 of the different uh, sources. And of course, the cost or the price uh, somewhere. Uh, I am not going to comment this in, in very detail, but just uh, a few elements. For the moment, in, in the world, coal is the largest uh, resource used to produce electricity. It's also probably the largest uh, fossil reserves that we uh, are. It's available on demand. I mean by that that the plants can run uh, continuously and uh, you don't, you are not dependent on weather uh, to, to supply <coughs> and to have them uh, operate. Unfortunately, on the bad side, uh, it's a great emission uh, of uh, CO2, about 800 grams or even a kilo uh, per kilowatt hour of CO2. And, and the cost for those plants is mainly, I would say, driven uh, by the cost uh, of the fuel and possibly by the cost of uh, CO2 if we put a, a value to the uh, carbon. Another way to put that is to say that if you have to put uh, devices, provisions to capture uh, the carbon and store it afterwards, it also increases the cost. That's another way, another way to put the things. <coughs> uh, among the uh, uh, sources which uh, emit uh, quite a lot of CO2, you have gas and oil. Gas emits a little less, it's a little better in terms of uh, environment. It's um, I qualify this as medium resource uh, in this area. It's available on, uh, on demand, but there also the cost is made mainly by the fuel and the CO2 uh, price. On the uh, other side, you have a few other sources which uh, are low emitters of uh, CO2, nuclear, hydro, and uh, other renewables. <coughs> For nuclear, um, the cost is driven mainly by the cost of construction, also a little bit by uh, operation and maintenance, but not by the fuel. <coughs> uh, it's available on demand, uh, and the resources can be considered as either medium or very large, uh, depending on the technologies. <coughs> Hydro uh, is a renewable, so the potential in, in time is indefinite, but the resource itself is limited in certain areas of the world. For instance, in Europe, you don't have uh, many uh, new possibilities to build hydro plants. Wind and solar have uh, specific characteristics, which is that they are intermittent. 
you cannot rely on them uh, all the time. It emits, of course, low uh, quantities of CO2, but this may be variable depending on how they are fabricated and where. <coughs> and in terms of cost, of course the fuel doesn't cost uh, anything in that case, so it's capital cost for the construction. But you have to uh, introduce the fact that there is uh, a cost, a system cost. If you build a windmill, you probably have to build another plant next to it uh, if you want to be able to supply all day long. So you have to take into account some way, in some way this additional cost in the, the way uh, you count. There are certainly a lot of more detail to be said about the different sources, but that, I guess, gives uh, a, an idea of the main characteristics. So, we consider that in a well-designed uh, energy mix, given all those characteristics, <coughs> nuclear will be certainly a good part of the solution to produce large and permanent quantities of electricity for all the, the reasons I mentioned earlier. This is the opinion of a number of experts, and you can see here a graph showing the different perspective by different uh, experts. Uh, they are very viable, but a number of them show a significant increase uh, over time of the uh, amount of electricity produced by uh, nuclear energy. Another way to put that is that Nuclear appears to be a key component in uh, the energy policies of a number of countries. You can see on this chart, in blue the existing ones, and in uh, red the red circles, the intent uh, of construction of uh, new power plants uh, in different areas. It shows that a number of countries have this in mind and uh, consider this as a good solution. And by the way, you can also see that it's mainly in the eastern part in Asia that you see the major part of, uh, of that. <coughs> Just to maybe sum up a little bit uh, this area, the energy sector is certainly a growing uh, sector uh, with very important uh, issues there. <coughs> the availability of the resource the climate change uh, issues, which are called to the nature of the mix and the choices, the technical choices to be made, and of course the cost of all this to, uh, to a lower implementation. And uh, as an answer or a contribution to uh, answer of these uh, challenges, EDF has developed, I would say, a low carbon model for its electricity generation. <coughs> At this point, I guess I have to say a few words of what is EDF. So you, you have here on this chart, on this chart a few uh, characteristics of EDF. It's an energy company active in all businesses, uh, generation of course, transport and distribution, selling, trading, and all these. Uh, it's a major, or we wish to be a major player in the uh, worldwide revival of nuclear, uh, with a number of re reactors presently being operated, but also uh, foreseeing uh, the future. And we are, as was mentioned earlier, uh, committed to sustainable development uh, with very or almost zero CO2 uh, emission uh, electricity generation mixed. <coughs> I don't go through all the uh, figures which are, are there. You will eventually see that. A leading electricity producer in, in Europe. You have on this chart uh, a few of the, I would say, uh, either participation or subsidiaries that we have in different countries of uh, Europe. Uh, the main ones are shown there, but there are a few others more limited. Uh, EDF Energy here in the uh, UK is certainly one of the most important ones. Uh, it was created uh, in 2003 uh, through the merger of different uh, companies, London Electricity and uh, a few others, and expanded more recently with the acquisition of British Energy. 
It's the biggest generator of low carbon electricity in, in the UK. And uh, to give an idea, it's about 20,000 uh, people here. You have the chart, the location of the different generation sites, uh, and the ratio of uh, installed capacity uh, and the, the share of nuclear uh, in, in that, which explains this uh, low carbon uh, mix. <coughs> We, have also, we are also present in different uh, other areas in the world, uh, mainly maybe in China, as you can see, uh, and in uh, a few other countries. Those uh, participation cover uh, in some areas nuclear energy, like in China or in the US, uh, but also hydropower plants, uh, like in uh, Laos and Vietnam, uh, for instance. <coughs> Well, let's focus now on uh, nuclear uh, energy uh, in this uh, global landscape. <clears throat> our strategy, uh, our vision of the future is uh, threefold. First, uh, you've seen that we have a number of uh, existing power plants, uh, nuclear power plants in France, but also a number in the UK. It's, of course, the first priority is to continue safe and efficient operation of uh, these uh, fleets. This goes through uh, two main axes, I would say, there. Of course, uh, building and having continuous improvement in safety of those uh, uh, units, but also to extend uh, the life uh, of uh, operation, the, li the operation of those plants. We wish and we want to participate in the global development of nuclear energy. And for this, we are involved in new projects. And we also uh, have views in the longer term, and we think it's necessary to prepare that. And we support international uh, research. And I'll go rapidly through these different points by maybe focusing or taking the example of the French uh, situation uh, to some extent to uh, develop that a little bit. <coughs> it was mentioned uh, by the rector uh, earlier, we have 58 operating uh, units, uh, which represent about half of the uh, capacity installed uh, in, in France. But with this half, we generate almost 80% of the electricity in France. It simply means that those units run longer uh, during the year than the other ones. The uh, hydro plants or the fossil coal or gas uh, units are mainly uh, run, I would say, to cope with the adjustment uh, in demand, uh, semi-base production or peak uh, production. <coughs> It was also mentioned earlier, uh, we built this uh, fleet in a rather short time. Uh, you see on the upper graph uh, the different units, nuclear units that were built in France, but you can see that the bulk of that has been built within about 10 years. This was the oil crisis, and uh, as it was uh, mentioned, we had uh, no gas, no coal, no fuel, but we had some ideas and we tried to do that. This has been a real big uh, industrial and financial effort to, to build that. And by the way, uh, and you can see that on the lower graph, uh, it allowed both, I would say, substitution to oil, and in those years here, you can see the effect of substitution, really. But it also allowed the growth of electricity uh, generation all over time. And it's those two aspects who, in fact, did allow to finance uh, all this program. <clears throat> so this is a very important investment and an efficient one, which we consider has to be valued, really, uh, in the long run. And this is done uh, mainly through a process by which we, every 10 years, we reassess the safety and the performance of the units and make a number of upgrades as necessary. 
But the second uh, part of that is to extend and to run those units as long as possible. They were designed for 40 years, but given the uh, margins which uh, have been put there, uh, it's possible to operate them for 50 or 60 years, and even some people think uh, longer than that. <coughs> and so that leads to a kind of possible strategy uh, in the long run, which I tried to illustrate on this uh, diagram. In dark blue, you have the existing fleet assuming a 40 years life. <coughs> I mentioned earlier that uh, when we will replace those units, uh, we do not want to have such an important financial and industrial effort as we did earlier. Uh, sorry, because if we had to rebuild after 40 years, we would have to rebuild at the same rhythm that we did before. <coughs> so we will want to, I would say, smoothen the rhythm of uh, renewal of those units uh, and uh, expand it over maybe 25 years or so rather than uh, 10 years. This is assuming, which is uh, a realistic basis, that we will keep about the same level of nuclear uh, capacity in, in the country in, in the coming times. <clears throat> and of course, to keep that overall capacity almost constant, uh, we fill the gap, if I can say so, by uh, the extension of the uh, existing fleet, and that's the uh, part which is in uh, medium blue in, in the middle. And you cannot see uh, this, excuse me, you cannot see this easily on, on the diagram, but the average extension here is about, in this scenario, about 16 to 17 years, so which makes a real life of the units between 50 and, and, and 60 years. <coughs> so you can see the, the strategy in the long run uh, really relies on two things, extending the uh, operation duration of the existing fleet and having a smoothened process of renewal and replacement of the existing fleet after some time. <coughs> that will be done with reactors uh, of the so-called Generation 3, uh, and eventually, later on, with reactors from Generation 4. So at this time, I have to say a few words of what are Generation 3 and 4 uh, reactors. <coughs> This graph tries to illustrate uh, <coughs> this generation. Uh, this idea of generation was uh, set up around the years 2000 when uh, we were thinking of uh, building new plants around the world and we, it was easier, we had uh, a need to try and categorize, I would say, the, the units and uh, people invented those generation. The first one being the very initial ones. In France, it was the gas graphite uh, natural uranium ones. Here, the Magnox and uh, uh, a few others. <coughs> the generation two was said to be the existing uh, operating plants at that time. Most of them uh, by water reactors in the world. <coughs> uh, size well is part of that uh, here in, uh, in England. <coughs> Generation 3 were the units supposed to be built in a rather short term after that with advanced uh, design and Generation 4 what was, what, what was supposed to be coming later on. Uh, there is really no absolute definition uh, be, behind those uh, generations. Uh, it's a combination of timing and characteristic. Uh, we can consider that uh, Gen 3 is characterized by the new plants to be designed and built in a relative short term, starting from the years uh, 2000 or so, but taking into account in their design all the lessons learned from the, uh, the accidents like TMI, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, the uh, September 11th um, uh, event and all the uh, operating experience. On the contrary, <coughs> if I can say so, Gen 4 were the units or are the units supposed to be uh, designed and built later on, building on R&D innovations. 
a number of objectives have been set to, to them uh, in different areas, sustainability, safety, economics, and, and non-proliferation. And all this is uh, framed, you would say, in an international uh, cooperation uh, system, the International Forum, uh, which is a framework for R&D cooperation uh, worldwide. <coughs> Just um, a few illustrations of reactors candidate for uh, Gen 3. You understood from what I said earlier that part of uh, that is also uh, marketing ideas to put the uh, reactors on, on the market. Uh, the most or almost all the uh, reactor candidates for this uh, renewal are light water reactors. <coughs> and they divide in two broad categories, boiling reactors or pressurized uh, water reactors. You can see on these slides that in fact, uh, there are a number of projects, but in fact not so many, and they are located in uh, a, a small, rather small number of countries in terms of origin of uh, those uh, designs. I'm not going to go uh, through the characteristic and. Uh, uh, of uh, all these design, I will say a few words about EPR, which is the one in, in which we have been involved uh, the most uh, over time. Gen 4, uh, again, this uh, international forum selected six uh, different types of uh, possible reactors for the future, um, characterized by the uh, moderator, mainly by the moderator that they, they use. You have uh, gas, sorry, gas cool reactors. That's the first one. Uh, the two first ones. This is water. This is uh, sodium. This is lead, <coughs> used as uh, coolant and, moder and not moderator. And this is molten salt uh, reactors. Uh, again, it's a broad panorama of possible technologies that have to be investigated. But maybe one of the characteristics which is common, not to all, but to most of those reactors, is that they try to uh, make the best use of the resource in uranium. And they are fast reactors uh, with fast neutron in order to use all the uh, content in, uh, or most of the content in uh, uranium to handle uh, 38, uh, <coughs> which, by the way, is a means to extend the resource by a factor of 50 or, or 100 uh, when you use those technologies. So that's one of probably the main characteristic of the reactors uh, being investigated, I would say, uh, for Gen 4 even though uh, not all the people share the same vision of the, uh, the target that they have to follow. <coughs> they could also, and in some opinions, some of them could be used to, for other usage uh, than electricity generation, like uh, hydrogen generation, that could then be used in the transport sector, for instance. <coughs> Just a uh, little focus on, uh, I mean, the way to make technical choices, and I will uh, illustrate that by going through the EPR uh, story. <coughs> the EPR uh, had specific objective. It has been developed as a French-German uh, initiative in a European context, and the uh, idea was to develop uh, a project built <coughs> building on uh, experience, uh, so an evolutionary design, I'm not sure it's a very nice word, but an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary design based on the most recent French and German uh, concept at that time. <coughs> it was a way to get both, I would say, a reference and a warranty to be able <coughs> to implement uh, the industrial strategy I, I showed earlier. 
and the overall characteristics uh, of that project were driven by a threefold uh, vision. Uh, safety improvement, to take into account all the events I uh, mentioned and the experience. Environmental uh, protection, because the uh, regulation, constraints and uh, targets in, in, in this area are increasing all, over time. And of course, uh, competitiveness, uh, because it's, uh, it's a need. <clears throat> this has been already a long story. It started around uh, the, the uh, years of the, of the 90s. Uh, it has been a, a very uh, com complex but rich multicultural process, starting with the French uh, and German uh, actors that were involved. At that time, uh, in, on the industry side, it was Framatom and Siemens. They had not yet uh, merged. Uh, it was EDF and the German utilities uh, on the utility side. <coughs> and it involved also, from the very beginning, the French and uh, German safety authorities. Uh, and that's the way it started as a real project, I would say, with a lot of interaction there. <coughs> but in parallel, at the same time, uh, we had uh, the European utility requirement process which was uh, launched. It was a, a gathering of uh, the main utilities in Europe, uh, defining jointly what were the requirements uh, for new plants. And uh, you could see, you can see down there, the initial participant uh, of this EUR process, and uh, the UK, uh, that was UK Energy at that time, and then British Energy, uh, who were active uh, participants in this process. And, and the project, the EPR project per se, and the process of the requirements of utilities in connection with the safety authorities was really uh, meant uh, and, and developed in, in parallel. And uh, this exchange uh, between different technical culture, not only the, uh, technically the different, uh, was really a very rich process. I have been lucky to be one of the first director of this uh, project in the, uh, in the 90s. And really, uh, I can testify that it, it was very, very interesting. And you can have very nice uh, jobs, I would say, associated uh, with that kind of uh, project and development. <clears throat> In terms of safety, we really had three uh, main, I would say, goals uh, that we wanted to, uh, to face and, and, and to reach. The first uh, axis, the first line of uh, action and improvement was to reduce the probability of accident and to improve globally the reliability of all the systems. This has been done by a number of smaller or greater uh, uh, modification or new uh, implementation on the circuits and equipment. This has also been accomplished to the uh, increase in redundancy in the uh, safety trains, going from uh, a general practice of two trains to four trains. Uh, that allow both uh, increased safety and uh, increased uh, capability uh, for maintenance uh, of the, the systems. <clears throat> the second axis was, I would say, despite the reduction and the significant reduction that we achieved in the, the risk of accident, to take into account this in the design from the beginning and to put provisions uh, to cope with uh, severe accidents, including uh, coronal down. <clears throat> and so an illustration of that is that we install a core catcher at the bottom uh, of the uh, vessel uh, to be able to handle these type of uh, accidents without undue uh, releases outside, <clears throat> even in those cases. The third uh, axis for the uh, design has been to increase the robustness, the global robustness, against a whole set of external hazards, 
from uh, earthquakes uh, to floods, flooding to airplane crash, uh, of course. And an illustration of that capability is the very thick and strong uh, kind of shell, concrete shell, which uh, <coughs> is uh, around the main parts of the, uh, the plant, the reactor, the fuel building, and uh, at least two of the four safety trains. <coughs> This slide just sums up the overall characteristic of the uh, PR project. Um, I went already through uh, some of them. <coughs> uh, just a mention uh, about the uh, high output of the plant, 1600 or 1700, depending if we speak of uh, net or uh, uh, raw, uh, capability, capacity. <coughs> in, in most of the uh, I would say Western countries or countries where uh, we have a large uh, capacity of electricity uh, generation, there is a siting problem. <coughs> uh, and so it's useful to have large uh, output uh, for siting uh, to reduce the number of sites, but also it's a way to, I would say, reach competitiveness and to pay off for all this safety provisions or all the overall uh, provisions which are taken for maintenance and quality of the uh, units. <coughs> Not going to go all the details there. Just a few words about uh, the way we do uh, business. We, I'm sorry I used the French uh, wording because there's no exact translation uh, or simple translation for architect or sommelier. Architect engineer is not exactly the same meaning. Uh, built on our own history from uh, hydro plants to uh, fossil fuel plants, we have this kind of model where we uh, do not buy the plants turnkey. On the contrary, we manage all the project uh, we allot uh, the, the contracts to different suppliers and we manage the overall uh, process including uh, different steps like uh, factories, uh, surveillance in factories, management on the site construction and all this. This model, uh, we wish to implement it more generally, I would say in all uh, the uh, projects where we, have, we are involved, of course with the adaptations needed to uh, meet the project or country specificities depending on the organization. And you have there a list of the, <coughs> I would say, general tasks that we are doing, and in some cases, like the licensing process, it's a little bit different here in the UK because the actors are not exactly the, the same than it is in, uh, in, in France, where EDF does, I would say, almost all uh, the relation with the safety authority. It's here it's split a little bit in different, uh, <coughs> with different actors. Same thing for a few others. I'm not going to go there. But this is also to illustrate the fact that uh, we do not, uh, we are not simply, I would say, a future operator of the plant, but we are very much involved in the design construction, and there's a lot of jobs, uh, very interesting jobs, which are associated with those uh, activities. <coughs> Just a few pictures of uh, Flamanville, which in, in turn illustrate, I would say, the different uh, activities or different types of jobs that we are doing. <coughs> That's an overall uh, view of the site. We manage, uh, I mean, EDF manages uh, all the activity uh, on, on the, uh, the site. And you can see, by the way, that uh, it's a tight site, and so management of this is not such an easy task. <coughs> it needs uh, real skilled people to do that. <coughs> That's uh, another uh, few slides that show the type of uh, buildings which are being built. You have just an illustration here of the pumping station uh, which has to uh, accommodate 12 meters of uh, variation 
tidal variation, uh, not sure of the word in, in English. Uh, and by the way, Hinkley Point in, uh, in the UK here is about the same uh, order of magnitude or even a little uh, bigger, if I uh, understand correctly. So that the type of uh, building that have to be built to cope with that when you want to cool the, the plant with uh, seawater. Um, <clears throat> that was just to illustrate uh, another aspect of the site management and the risk management or the project management. Uh, in Flamanville, we had uh, a tunnel to discharge the cooling water uh, away, away from the intake. This is supposed to be made by a tunnel. Initially, it was supposed to be uh, digged uh, by explosives and the technique proved to be too slow and too difficult because the nature of the soil was not exactly what, what was expected. So we had to change uh, in the middle of the uh, course of the works to another technology using uh, that kind of tunneler. And uh, again, that was an interesting story, but uh, it is there just to illustrate that making those decisions which have impacts on cost, on delays, on contractual aspect with the different suppliers. It's not easy, but easier when all the different aspects are located in the same uh, company who can make the decision, I would say, a little bit uh, faster maybe and a little bit easier than when it's not. <clears throat> that just to illustrate the fact that we are also active and going to the factories to <coughs> monitor the fabrication. And by the way, it also illustrates the size <coughs> of some of the components. You have there the uh, ingot for the large uh, piece of uh, the, the ring where you have the uh, penetrations in, in a reactor vessel. And you have here the size of a, a person. It gives you an idea of the importance of those uh, pieces. And those are for the uh, uh, turbine uh, or, or the generator, uh, the electrical generator, sorry, I'm not sure. <clears throat> a few words uh, about in, in international uh, Development. I mentioned earlier we want to be part uh, using EPR as a reference. Uh, we want to be a part of the global revival in different countries. And so far we are present having projects in different uh, countries. This uh, chart tries to illustrate that. <coughs> uh, of course in, in, in France uh, with Plamonville that you saw in uh, another project which is uh, under preparation. We have um, two, two units uh, being built in China where we have uh, a participation uh, in the, not only in the construction but later on in the operation with a 30% stake in, in, in that uh, and which are also uh, going forward quite fast now. Uh, in uh, the US, we, uh, you probably heard of the uh, recent uh, adjustment in organization or in uh, <coughs> the, the process uh, that took place, but we have, uh, now it's no longer a joint venture, but uh, a company, Unistar, with the intent to build uh, few EPRs. The first one uh, should be uh, built at the Calvert Cliffs uh, site there and it's now a, a, an EDF uh, subsidiary so far. And of course there are uh, UK, <coughs> I'll come back on this, and other uh, countries which have showed, uh, shown interest in, uh, in EPR designs and EPR projects in which uh, we have some discussions underway, like Italy and, uh, and Poland, for instance. <clears throat> That's it. Well, 
I'm not going to go through uh, too much on this uh, <coughs> uh, slide. Already some uh, elements have been said, but here in the UK, the intent is to uh, build EPR units uh, on <coughs> using existing sites uh, in uh, Hinkley Point and, uh, and Sizewell, where you already have existing uh, units. And they are located here on, on the map in the southern part of, uh, of uh, UK. <coughs> the intent there is that the first unit be operational in 2018. And uh, this should be done by combining, I would say, the uh, capabilities uh, of EDF as a whole and EDF energy more specifically here in the UK. I mentioned initially the, the different roles uh, in the construction, uh, a role of architect engineer uh, taken by uh, EDF in association uh, with the, the, the real client here being EDF energy. And we want to, I would say, to benefit of a series effect by being able to build uh, four units, but also benefiting from the experience gained in the uh, realization uh, done in France and in China, which are uh, upstream from, from uh, those. And uh, by the way, I just mentioned that uh, uh, Centrica, which is a partner of EDF Energy uh, globally, has uh, an option to be participant at the same level in these new projects here in, in the UK. <coughs> That's the picture of the existing site and uh, a photomontage of the uh, uh, location of the uh, new units for Inkley Point. Nuclear industry uh, is an industry that really employs quite a great number of people. <coughs> in EDF, in the group, we have about 35,000 people currently being involved in, in, in nuclear. Uh, a large fraction of uh, the cost is made by mine power in the different area. It means simply uh, that it's really uh, not, I would say, the raw material or the fuel that makes the most of the, uh, the, the cost and the, uh, what is needed in, in to build and, and then operate those, uh, those units. It's an industry which has uh, long-term visions and plans, uh, typical uh, duration for design and construction phases, for operation are shown there, for dismantling uh, also, and I don't speak of waste management, which is still uh, longer. So it means that those long-term perspectives and this uh, big number of uh, people employed in the sector, it means uh, opportunity for careers. And I don't know if people uh, like to speak of long-term uh, perspectives for uh, careers, but it's not jobs that are going to end uh, shortly after people uh, got there. Uh, about 40% of those uh, people uh, in the different parts of the uh, EDF group are about to retire in the, in the coming years. <coughs> it's simply because they all take uh, one year each year and they have been recruited mostly uh, when we implemented these big programs, especially in France, but that's true in the, in the other countries uh, as well. And in addition to those people who are going to leave and that have to be replaced, uh, there is also an additional need uh, coming from the fact that we have new projects developing uh, outside of the uh, starting countries. <coughs> Which means that we have uh, uh, recruitment plans uh, for over 6,000 engineers and the same, about the same numbers of technicians uh, during the next uh, 10 years or so, 
uh, in France, UK, and also in, uh, in a few other countries. <coughs> Just to illustrate that, um, we uh, have increased our recruitment rate by a factor of four to five, uh, coming from an average of uh, 100 or so to uh, about 600 right now. And if you add uh, to that uh, the plans here in the uh, in, uh, UK, it's about 200 more, uh, which uh, are to be recruited in the coming years, just for, for UK. <coughs> I put on the uh, right side a graph uh, showing the type of jobs that the young people uh, occupy as a first job. And this is just to illustrate the fact that it's for nuclear uh, activities, but in fact we don't recruit only nuclear physicists or neutronicians uh, or people directly involved, uh, specialists of nuclear areas but that the jobs involved in nuclear involve the overall, uh, uh, or, or the, all the different types of uh, skills. We need civil engineering, uh, we need uh, electricity, uh, mechanics, and, uh, and all these. And uh, so all those people need also to have a nuclear background at some point, but it's really the combination of uh, all these skills which is very important to implement and to operate uh, nuclear power plants. <clears throat> Given that uh, context, in fact, uh, we, have, we are committed to uh, upgrade uh, the, the skills, uh, to renew the people, and our uh, vision, our effort in, uh, in EDF is in fact two, twofold. First, we had to adapt, uh, mainly uh, to adapt the internal system uh, to train the people to the larger number of newcomers and by creating an uh, academy uh, for nuclear operations or for, or for nuclear engineering. Uh, just to give an idea, we, uh, we have more than 2.5 million hours of training per year for all our, uh, our people uh, in France and it needs a staff of about 700 people just to uh, to uh, implement this uh, training process. Uh, in the UK there's a nuclear power academy that has been uh, uh, installed in, uh, in, in Barnwood for the same uh, type of purpose. <coughs> That's one part of the effort uh, in uh, building the skills. The other part is upstream. <coughs> it's we did develop a dialogue and uh, work together with the best universities or grandes écoles in, in, in France, uh, in France, but also uh, in other countries to uh, improve, extend, expand the existing programs, or to. Uh, set in place new uh, initial academic uh, programs to better suit uh, the needs of the industry. <coughs> uh, and Imperial College is one of the uh, partners uh, with whom we work and was uh, one of the reasons of this uh, presentation uh, today as part of this uh, overall uh, collaboration that we have together. <coughs> um, <coughs> Just as an illustration, we uh, developed and we uh, implemented a new program in France, building on, uh, it's a partnership between different schools uh, and uh, universities in France. Um, and what I wanted to, I would say, mainly um, show with this uh, type of uh, program that we developed, uh, is that we uh, introduce their specialties like operations or nuclear plant design uh, as part of the uh, program, the, the teachings, uh, because we found that in fact those uh, disciplines or specialties were not really uh, done, teached in any uh, program. Uh, 
we used to in the past to train to form those people directly inside EDF and if we can have a number of uh, people having already a good background in those areas it's easier to integrate them faster and it's also better for the uh, students uh, who do not need to have to go back to school uh, when they join uh, the company. <coughs> and well, this program, by the way, is also uh, fully in English, despite the fact that it is in French. Uh, in France. <coughs> and it's one of the program which is uh, a basis of uh, relation, uh, relationship with the Imperial College. Another, uh, a few other examples of uh, academic partnership in the UK. Uh, with Imperial, we have a number of uh, exchanges. Uh, and uh, one of the support of uh, these exchanges is an uh, R&D partnership. Uh, that's simply because research is also, I would say, the other uh, facet, the other side of uh, teaching, and goes together, and it's a good way uh, to uh, both support uh, teachings, but also to develop partnerships in areas uh, where we have needs uh, in, uh, in both countries. <coughs> and there are uh, a few other examples of um, uh, partnership or cooperation with the uh, academic institution in Barnwin. Uh, I mentioned that uh, site uh, already, or in uh, Bridgewater, which is located uh, close to the Hinkley Point uh, site, and uh, where it's a, a way to, uh, I would say, implement uh, local cooperation, even though in a number of cases it, in, it involves uh, institutions which are not specifically or not only uh, local ones. <coughs> so I guess I have been a little bit too long already. Just to try and sum up, I uh, guess we can consider that really nuclear energy uh, maintains or even improves its relevance as part of energy policies uh, worldwide. You could see that on the, the, the initial chart that I showed. In our strategy, uh, in EDF, it will remain a very significant component. It's not exclusive. We are not uh, pure nuclear. It goes along with other sources like uh, hydro and uh, other renewables, but also to some extent with uh, steel gas uh, plants because we need to be able to adjust, I would say, the demand all the time. EPR, uh, the project making the best of the French and German experience and uh, European visions also, is the basis for us for joint projects. Uh, in France, Flamanville uh, is certainly uh, has been a way to show, to pave the way for that. In the UK, it's going to be implemented <coughs> by uh, EDF Energy uh, in partnership with uh, Centrica, which has a stake in there. It's a basis also for worldwide uh, projects uh, as our contribution to a low carbon uh, energy mix. And behind this, uh, there is a major challenge, uh, which is to be able to really build those units in series, as we have been able to do it in France. And this goes uh, through or, or requires some kind of uh, harmonization at uh, global level, uh, at the level of the requirements, the safety requirements, or more generally the regulations, uh, in order to be really able to implement I would say, efficient industrial uh, standardization. And all this is made uh, possible only if we have all the qualified and talented people uh, and uh, which are the basis to develop and to use I mean, not only individual skills, but really building collective skills that are the basis for uh, successful uh, projects. So with that, I've been 
too long, and I thank you for your attention.